that's what happens with these, you know, remember the worst boss you've ever had. Oh, they can remember it. Trust me. <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. The suffering continues. They yeah. still have some trauma around. Yeah, you can be talking to somebody near retirement age, and their example is from somebody that they worked for in high school. 100%. And they still remember how this person did not treat them with dignity, 100%. and it stuck with them 50 years later. Welcome again to It Doesn't Take a Genius, conversation with introspective perspectives and pithy points of view. Here are your hosts, my friends, Max and Marty. I think that's Mark and Mike. Yeah, whatever. Silent. There we go. Oh, okay. Now we're, now we're good. Okay, this is going to happen. Good. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. In. Ramsey! Marshall, what a pleasure to see you in person. <laughs> That Incredibly was, intimidating, to be honest with you. That was too much eye contact. It sure was. Yeah. So let's keep that. looking that way. Yeah, All camera. Right. Let's look at the camera. For those not on YouTube, we should uh, tell our audio listeners, both of you, that we are in person, uh, in the same city at the same time. Last time we tried to do this, it was a giggle fest and went nowhere for about 10 minutes. This time it was um, a dumpster fire for about two minutes, so we're we're getting better. But we did we recorded the whole first segment with a muted mic, and you know that's that's about the level of professionalism you have here. So, and I know some of you out there are very excited about the prospect of a muted mic. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> oh, that was good right there. Oh, the comedy gold. I'm going to move on. Okay, thank well, you, should. Okay, so uh, I, I told you I came prepped. I mean, I got, I got notes, folks. I got show notes for this one. You used actual toner and ink. Well, funny, the, funny, wow. funny you mentioned that because uh, my hotel, um, I printed out this at the hotel. Mm-hmm. And it got printed out on things that already had stuff printed on it. And I said, I think somebody's messed with your uh, your paper. And sure enough, every single page was already printed on. And so they fixed that for me. And, uh, and then we realized that the ink was not working either. Hmm. So they went to fix that for me. And then they found out from the general manager of the hotel that uh, they were getting a new printer. And so there was, <laughs> there was no option. So they had to print it personally for me from the desk. So, oh man! You know how this it is. is. You're, yeah, you're VIP. Kind of a customer service story, really. It is. That is a nice customer service story. And uh, and that's theoretically at least half of what we do here, right? Customer mm-hmm. experience, employee engagement. I think that's those are the the big things uh, in in the leadership development sphere that we do. And I'm going to come back to something today that hits on both of those. And um, we've done a three-parter on this. I went back and looked. We did a three-parter on the concept of dignity. Yes. And I remember, you know, specifically, you were like, "Make it make sense to me." I don't, I don't get this one book. Uh, it was Donna Hicks's uh, "Leading with Dignity." You were, you were not as impressed with. Well, I don't know that that's fair, but you were, you were like, you know, make it relevant. I so. wasn't sure what I could do with it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love the idea. Right. And I believe in it. Wasn't sure how I could bring it to the world. You're pro dignity. Uh, yeah. 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 Just go on the record. <laughs> pro dignity. Well, so I was thinking about that as I was reading, no surprise here, Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, the, I mean, I, I assume the finest book ever written by an American. Uh, Booker T. Washington. Uh, I mean, and, and this is, I'm just telling you folks, this is, we're not done mining for gold from Up From Slavery. I mean, there are so many good things about Up From Slavery, but I got some bits on dignity that I wanted to share because it's, it really is practical. I mean, it, it's, it is truly practical and, and how you interact with uh, your your fellow workers, your your customers, people that um, frankly are rude, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see we'll see how far we go with this. But I, I just have to share this story because I think it's insane, just insane. Awesome! Prepare for insanity. That will probably be our you know bite you know bit clicky uh, you know oh, title. Sure. Uh, yeah. 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 In- Lost- Booker T goes insane. <laughs> <laughs> but well, the, I I. I do wonder if he would get canceled today, but that's, you know, you'll see what I mean as we go through this. So, um, so here's the deal. Uh, first off, let's get it on the record. Booker T. Washington was a black man. He was a freed slave. Uh, he, uh, became an incredibly successful American. He went up from slavery all the way to, you know, kind of hobnobbing with some presidents and having influence in the, on the world stage. 
and uh, there's a there's there's you know a, a sort of a reconciliation, a conciliatory tone that he takes through his autobiography. But well aware he is he is very well aware that America is racist toward Negroes. All right, as as he would have said it. And so there's a scene in the book just that that caught my attention. Um, he's in charge at the Hampton Institute, which is the school that trained him and where he first was was teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we talked about this the last time we talked about Booker T. That there was this idea that labor was something that was uh, that had dignity. Frankly, there was dignity in labor, and that was part of how they could overcome prejudicial prejudicial treatment. So he learned all that at the Hampton Institute. And while there, he was put in charge of a program where they were taking Native Americans and giving them some education. And uh, he has many, many things to say about that. We're, we're, we're not going to have time to cover it here, but here's, here's the funny incident, incident that just shows how racist things were. Um, so he had to transport a sick uh, Indian boy uh, back to Washington, D.C., so that he could be transported back to the reservation that he came from because he, he was sick. And so he says that on this journey, um, he goes by steamboat. Uh, the bell rings for dinner. Uh, he he you know he he's a smart man. He's wise. He he waits for everybody else and doesn't you know doesn't want to uh, uh, cause any uh, issue where he he looks like he's causing problems because he knows that it's a racist system. And uh, after they finish their meal, he goes in with the the young Indian. And uh, the man, it says, the man in charge politely informed me that the Indian could be served, but that I could not. Wow. He says, I could never understand how he knew just where to draw the color line, since the Indian <laughs> and I were about of the same complexion. Uh, the steward, however, seemed to be an expert in the matter. So um, it happened again at a hotel. The Indian can stay at a hotel, but you can't, Booker T. Washington. So... Um, so he, uh, he, he, in that similar uh, vein, he later tells a story of going to this town where he's, uh, he's, you know, everybody's all up in arms and like he thinks, you know, there might be a lynching. And the issue was that there was this dark skinned man uh, who tried to check in at the local hotel. And everybody calmed down when they realized that the dude was Moroccan. He was a, <laughs> oh. it was a Moroccan who could speak oh, English. We, we serve Moroccans. <laughs> yeah, Moroccans, <laughs> definitely welcome. But the, but the best part is that the Moroccan, after that, found it prudent. It says, he found it prudent after that to not speak English. So the guy had to act more foreign than he was so that the white people wouldn't get all crazy about this you know, black guy getting uppity. Yeah, we so. can't discriminate against him. He's not from around here. <laughs> right. <laughs> This this makes so much sense. All the, the logic is is impeccable here. It's, it's hard so, to refute. So some customer service moments there, right? Yeah. Um, so all of that to say this, like I mean, he this is in his autobiography. He knows that it's a racist system. At the very beginning of the whole thing, he relates, you know, his childhood, and this is how he talks about his father. He says, "Of my father." I know even less than of my mother. I do not even know his name. I have heard reports to the effect that he was a white man who lived on one of the nearby plantations. And we know what that means, right? Mm -hmm. Whoever he was, I never heard of his taking the least interest in me or providing in any way of my rearing. But I do not find a special fault with him. He was simply another unfortunate victim of the institution which the nation unhappily had engrafted upon it at that time. My poor dad, who, you know, was uh, uh, unwilling to acknowledge a black son and probably raped my mother, uh, just an unfortunate victim of this institution. So, so that was the first thing that caught my attention, but I had to give you all the racist stuff so that you could hear, like, you know, like right from the get-go, he's like, yeah, this, this thing really hurt a lot of people, hurt a lot of white people. That's at the front of the whole autobiography. That's and I'm amazing. Like, what you know? The the amount of empathy, the the forgiveness. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you know everything that uh, that that goes with that. Wow, hundred percent. So I, I I kept that in my mind as I'm reading the whole thing. Like you know what is wow. going on here? How does he justify that with just a little phrase and then moves on to his next point? 
And so I got to another section and we talked about this gentleman last time. Uh, he had a mentor who was the son of uh, missionaries in Hawaii, who was a Civil War hero, uh, who was the founder, I believe, of the Hampton Institute, where, mm. where Booker T. was trained, uh, General Armstrong. And uh, so, so General Armstrong later in life comes to visit Tuskegee Institute, where Booker T. has, you know, uh, created this, you know, what will, what will become a dynasty, you know, just an American institution. And so he has some things to say about it. Um, he says, the first visit which General Armstrong made to Tuskegee gave me an opportunity to get an insight into his character, such as I had not before had. Um, and he says, it's, what he means by that is his interest in the Southern white people. He had assumed that General Armstrong would harbor some resentment, uh, you know, having fought against the Southern white man, that maybe he cherished a feeling of bitterness toward the, the white South and found out that really um, he, he was not. Uh, he said uh, what, what Booker T. observed General Armstrong do was that he was as anxious about the prosperity and the happiness of the white race as the black. He cherished no bitterness against the South and was happy when an opportunity offered for manifesting his sympathy. Um, he says, I never heard him speak in public or in private a single bitter word against the white man in the South. And so he said from that moment on, uh, he learned a lesson that great men cultivate love and that only little men cherish a spirit of hatred. Um, I learned that assistance given to the weak makes the one who gives it strong and that oppression of the unfortunate makes one weak. So I got a little bit more here of a quote, but Armstrong set the tone. Armstrong, completely conciliatory himself right, and, and uh, ready to go there. <clears throat> So well, you, you think yeah. about how rare that is, uh, you know, because right. I know people who truly cherish their bitterness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? 100%. They, they, they make it the bitterness, the, the, the resentment, the, the, yeah. the centerpiece uh, of their table of life. Exactly I mean, it's, right. it's just right there in the middle and, it, and it's all consuming. And, and the things that they are bitter about pale in comparison <laughs> right. to the slavery and war and right. oppression and you know just yeah. like like they're minor indiscretions but they're they're clinging to them with great fervor yeah yeah and and uh and you know holding on to hurt you know like it came it maybe came from a good place even you know the the you know you really hurt me you really hurt these people and and making that an attack you know, using that that negative emotion as an attack, as a weapon, um, and and so Booker T says, "I'll have none of that." And so here's here's the quote. Wow. So so his his lesson was that he resolved that I would permit no man, no matter what his color might be, to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate him. With God's help, I believe that I have completely rid myself of any ill feeling toward the Southern white man for any wrong that he may have inflicted upon my race. And, and says, I pity from the bottom of my heart any individual who is so unfortunate as to get into the habit of holding race prejudice. Now, this is not actually a podcast episode about racism. The thing that caught my attention, Mike, was this little bit here where he says, if I hate him, it narrows and degrades my own soul. Mm -hmm. So, so here's, here's where all this connects with the, the dignity stuff. He says, uh, the more I consider the subject, the more strongly I am convinced that the most harmful effect of the practice to which the people in certain sections of the South have felt themselves compelled to resort in order to get rid of the force of the Negro's ballot is not wholly in the wrong done to the Negro, but in the permanent injury to the morals of the white man. He says, the wrong to the Negro is temporary, but to the morals of the white man, the injury is permanent. So imagine this, where, where someone is getting mistreated. Booker T says, yep, that mistreatment happened. It's real and it's temporary, but the effect on the person doing the mistreatment, it's a permanent injury to the morals of that person. He gives examples. You know, the, the, the white man at the time would perjure themselves to uh, try to get blacks, uh, uh, you know, disenfranchised, get them, get them unable to, to cast a ballot. He said those people would go on to be dishonest in other areas of their life. Uh, he says that they, they would cheat 
Negroes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in business and so on. Well, they would end up cheating the white man. Uh, they would lynch Negroes, and by golly, they would use violence against white men eventually. You know that these people just got ensnared in, you know, I'll call it a sin. You know, they got in, they got ensnared in in this uh, treating people like they didn't matter who did matter. You know, that's 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 the definition of a violation of dignity. You know, I'm treating you like you ain't worth nothing. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, it was really the person who did the indignity who was uh, hurting as, as badly, if not more, according to Booker T, than the mm -hmm. person who got mistreated. Oh, yeah. And we hear that today where, you, you know, people talk about that, that if somebody is, is hating you, yeah. it's, it's not a reflection of you. It tells you mm -hmm. everything that you need to know about them. Hard to take me seriously about this. <laughs> yeah, you're having your Chick Fil A. Uh, and, yeah, you're, you're right. But, and you know, you've heard that that the emotionally healthy people uh, do not hate other people. Emotionally healthy people do not bully uh, other people. They don't steal from other people. It's right. it's only people who who are struggling with their with their own sense of self, their their own dignity, their own securities. Those are the people who find excuses. Uh, to treat other people poorly. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really uh, really really wise, and um, and and it ties to the Donna Hicks material. So that for those that uh, haven't watched our three part our three part episodes, uh, we'll link to the show notes, uh, link to it in the show notes. But uh, the quote that I really liked from from her work was, uh, "We all want to be treated in ways that show we matter." And when we are not treated this way, we suffer. And the flip side, she says, is also true. That when we make somebody suffer, we ourselves suffer as a result. Mm -hmm. it, it violates the whole system. Um, so so, that, so that's, her, that's her real point is that people have to be treated as if they matter. Uh, I think because they do. Ooh. I think that's the whole point is that actually people do matter and that's what we're, you know, uh, I think most of our work sort of revolves around making sure that employees show customers that they matter, that bosses show employees that they matter, um, that, uh, you know, uh, various corporations show the people in the corporations and the departments in the corporations that they matter. And when they don't, they're hurting people. But they're the ones paying the price. You know, they, they are the ones having a, a, a suffering of their own. Oh, yeah. And how many times have we told managers? Because managers are like, well, then I, I can't get on my people. I can't correct them. No. Yeah. No, we, 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 we have a, a saying, we, we, it, you can be direct with respect. That's right. And so, so yeah, you can, you can address the issue. You can address the, the, the performance issue. You can address the, the thing that's going on. You just don't have to demean the dignity of the person across from you that's receiving it. Uh, if you treat them like a human being, but you're direct and you're clear about what the expectation is and right. the consequences, that's perfectly fine. You just don't have to yell and scream to do it. That's it. That's it exactly. And um, and and we'll uh, again uh, link to some of Donna Hicks' material, but I'll I'll just quickly go through. She has ten elements, uh, ten ways that you can uh, honor dignity. Um, and it's uh, the acceptance of identity, you know, letting somebody be their, their real self regardless of, you know, race and, and so on. Uh, recognizing them, giving them recognition for uh, work that they've done. Acknowledging them, you know, just acknowledging that they exist and have opinions and, and, uh, and have things that have happened to them in the workplace. Inclusion, um, uh, she talks about belonging, you know, making them feel mm -hmm. like they're belonging. But I would go so far as to say, you know, sometimes it's inclusion on what's going on. Just very simple things, you know, like uh, people that feel like they're left in the dark. You know, that's not inclusion. You know, mm -hmm. so just keeping people updated is a, is a simple example. Safety is another one. Um, and, of course, safety could be physically. I mean, I've had workplaces, I don't know about you, but, you know, where that's been an issue. You know, where mm -hmm. the, the lighting is bad or the training is bad and people are not safe. Um and I've uh, and I've also had psychological safety uh, be an issue, uh, fairness, treating people justly and, and respectfully, uh, independence, letting them make some decisions. I think we'd call that empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, understanding, you know, that you're you're spending time trying to get to know where they're coming from. 
uh, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Mm. That's a big one. And then accountability. And accountability meaning I'm going to be accountable to you when I've done something that violates the dignity. And she has 10 temptations for dignity too, but let, let's start there. And um, it, does anything from that list grab you as, as something we just, you know, <laughs> we keep running <laughs> running it's, into these? <laughs> it's all we talk about. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's 100% of all we talk about when yeah. we talk about coaching and 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 leading and and caring for your people and getting to know them and you know and right. making sure that you recognize them and and provide them feedback and make sure that they're informed yeah. right yeah we 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 preach this we give people specific tips on how to do these these very specific things yeah um, so, that, that's a good yeah. way to put it that, that there's there are some specific actions you can take um you know you, you can I'm, I'm not saying you can fake it and it works out for you but there are there are really specific things you can do, such as, you know, like we talk about management by walking around. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do that in a, in a fake way where you just walk around and, and, you know, make people feel like you're looking over their shoulder. Well, that's not honoring dignity. But if you, if you did it with the point of, I'd like to get to know my people a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I'd like them to know that I'm listening to what's going on. Well, my goodness, guess what? You've just honored dignity and raised the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the value of your workplace, frankly. Mm -hmm. So, um, 10 temptations to dignity. So this is what you can do that will violate dignity. And uh, some, some of these I think overlap a little bit, but uh, take the bait. You know, you violate my dignity, I'll violate yours. I'm mm -hmm. gonna I'm gonna go tit for tat with you. Save face. I'm, I'm going to pretend like that didn't really uh, happen. I'm gonna just hold back and and uh, not not let on that you know there's something I've done that that might be an issue. Uh, shirking responsibility, you know, I'm not going to own the things that I've done that are a problem. Uh, seeking false dignity, this is a good one. So I want approval from my boss or from people around me. So I'm going to get validation, feel like I matter by some external circumstances, external in for. Uh, 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 you know, influences, yeah. Instead of knowing that I just have dignity, you know, the, the way I put it is, you know, you know, uh, you just have dignity because you're a creation of God made in His image. You know, I, I don't need you to tell me I have worth. You know, right. I've, I've already got that. So if you if you seek it falsely, that's that's the problem. Seeking false security. So you violate my dignity, but I really want to have a relationship with you. So I'm just going to gloss over that. Hmm. Well, I violated my own dignity by doing that. You know, that's that's a right. problem. Right. Um, at similar front avoiding confrontation. I'm just not gonna not gonna go there with you and, and say, hey, you just violated so and so's dignity or my dignity. I'm just gonna skip over it. Claiming victimhood. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Claiming victimhood. So uh, we've talked about this with crucial conversations, which we have another series on. We'll link to that as well. But um, if I claim victimhood, I've kind of shut myself down from being able to have a conversation with you to make things better. Because I basically have said, I'm the victim here, you are the one at fault, and I refuse to have any conversation about what part of this I may own. Right. That's a problem. Uh, resisting feedback, similar vein, right? Like I'm just not going to hear from you anything that is uh, challenging how I'm approaching things. Uh, Blame and shame others to deflect off of me and put it back onto you. That's that's a dignity violation. And then gossip. Gossip is a dignity violation, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not willing to go to you, but because I need a safety valve on this frustration I have with you, I'm going to go talk to so-and-so. Well, now I'm treating you like you don't matter and not giving you a chance to own a mistake and you know that, that whole clarity is kindness thing mm -hmm. never gets a chance. So, so those are the temptations to dignity. I just, I, I think um, a lot of these are, you know, small aggressions in many cases. And you just think of, you know, Booker T would have had the right to, you know, just, uh, just absolutely blast people. In some cases, I mean, I think you could, you can almost see like uh, revenge fantasies playing out where he'd want to hurt people. Oh, yeah. Physically hurt people, right? He got yes. whipped, you know, mm -hmm. and... And here in our day and age, it's a workplace violation like, you know, hey, you know, you didn't tell me directly. But but that is still a dignity violation and it and it and it hurts you as well as them. 
Oh, yeah. What's interesting about this list is we, we do an exercise in some of our workshops where we have uh, people brainstorm what are some of the attributes of the best leaders that they've ever worked for. Right. right? Who are the best leaders? And we, 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 you know, we, we document all that. And then uh, we've even done the flip side of that is think about the, the, you know, the, the worst boss you ever had and, and share with us no names, but just share with us the attributes of that person. And the flip chart ends up looking like this list of ten temptations. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, there's so many items from yeah. that from that list. You're avoiding confrontation and resisting feedback and yeah. shirking responsibility and, and jumping to conclusions and gossip. You know, yep. it's it's all in that list. So people know it, right? They they don't have Donna Hicks's list, but right. they but inside they know this isn't right. This isn't how you treat other people especially when you're in a leadership role yeah. and you're an authority figure yeah. and you have a, you know above average power over people's lives. Right. And and I guess we should have said Donna Hicks came at this from the angle of working with peace negotiations. So she had connections with like uh, IRA bombings and um, you know Middle East peace negotiations and I can't remember all the different places she was, but she kept saying you can't ever deal with folks who want peace, both sides want peace. They've got the smartest guys in the room sitting at the bargaining table, so to speak. And because of these dignity violations, they they have such a long-term, you know, traumatic impact on people. You know, mm -hmm. people are truly suffering and hurting um, because of these dignity, dignity violations. They can't ever have the peace process happen because they haven't dealt with that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with these, you know, remember the worst boss you've ever had. Oh, they can remember it. Trust me. <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. The suffering continues. They yeah. still have some trauma around. Yeah, you can be talking to somebody near retirement age, and their example is from somebody that they worked for in high school. 100%. And they still remember how this person did not treat them with dignity, 100%. and it stuck with them 50 years later. That, that That's it. exactly it. And so, so, you know, the good news is that, uh, Don Hicks has a, a list of things you can do to combat this, and it is actually quite easy to combat. I guess I, guess I say easy. I mean, it's somewhat simple. It it takes some courage. You know, mm -hmm. you have to open up, and you know, courage comes from the word heart, um, uh, the French word for heart, and uh, it takes showing your heart a little bit here. But it is very simple to do. I'll give you the list. Um, honor your dignity as well as others dignity that's one of the things you can do is mm -hmm. it's an essential skill just you know in other words follow those 10 elements of dignity uh, defend your dignity with skill and humanity when necessary which is what Booker T did you know he's got this book that's just this eloquent um, uh, 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 retelling of what happened to him without throwing all sorts of jabs it's it's just uh, very very simply telling telling the story and saying that that was wrong and you know, I, I think there's two sides to this story. Uh, give, receive, and ask for feedback. Pursuing feedback. This is, this is a little bit like mining for conflict, which is uh, mm -hmm. one of the Patrick Lencioni terms. But um, basically, I'm going to make sure that I've gotten from you, is there any issue here? Is there any feedback you can give me on, on where I've uh, uh, caused problems for you? Uh, resolve conflict with dignity. Mm -hmm. That's another one. So, so in other words, we're going to work through this conflict, but we can do it with dignity where we're honoring the fact that we, mm -hmm. we both matter. Um, and crucial conversations, I think, really points to that. And then the final one is take responsibility for violating the dignity of, dignity of others. So mm -hmm. if, if you're aware that it happened, then own it and uh, do something to, to uh, you know, uh, honor the fact that you are aware of that and, and repair the damage. So... Mm -hmm. That's the list, man. Yeah, the, uh, the, yeah. You, you know, I resolve conflict with dignity. I immediately thought of you can disagree without being disagreeable. That's right. Uh, you know, there's no reason we can't have a civil conversation about uh, all of these things, uh, where where we agree and where we disagree. Um, so yeah, it's a wonderful list. Uh, very difficult to do in the moment. Yes. When the when the emotions high and the amygdala is hijacked and right. you're you know you're you're full on to to be able to instead of reacting to be able to choose your response. Yeah. And I think that's the part that that takes practice and and it takes years uh, to to get to the point where 
where I can decide, okay, here's the best way to respond in this mm-hmm. moment uh, for the, the conversation that we're about to have or the situation we're about to deal with. Yeah, and, and a, a lot of what you're saying there, it, it kind of boils down to are you willing to have a, well, I wonder if it's still working. It is. Wow, that is so weird when it keeps doing that. We'll, we'll edit that out. Uh, so uh, you, you've got to do some planning, journaling, thinking. There's got to be some time you dedicate to processing. How did that go this week, this day, uh, to where you get to the place where you can say, okay, I've made a decision. I'm going to go have that conversation that I need to have about my dignity being violated or, or the dignity I violated in somebody else. Or I wonder how they're thinking. I better go collect some feedback. These are, these are things you can do. And again, I want to highlight the reason we're having this conversation at all is because it's not just, oh, that's bad. That's wrong. That's morally wrong. It's this is deflating the entire organization. You are hurting as much as they are hurting when when you cause suffering on treating somebody like they matter. Mm. If you're treating them that way, it's it's impacting you, and it's probably impacting you more long term. So, there we go. Fantastic. Well, in commemoration of our third Booker T. Washington episode, I'm very excited about wow. that. I have for you uh, the authentic. <laughs> United States currency, 1946, Booker T. Washington silver half dollar. Wow. Mark and Joy. I, well, you talked about this, and I thought it was kind of a joke, but, uh, man, and he's such a good-looking guy. I don't know if I can oh, show. He's man can candy, I, yeah. Can I show this? He, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's a good-looking human being. But, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's really nice of you, Mike. You're Really nice welcome. of you. I will treasure this always. Yes, please do. It's pure silver. <laughs> and uh, is it really? <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. Um, the uh, this this is uh, in the words of the Apple Dumpling Gang. Um, I believe the Apple Dumpling Gang rides again. I'm not sure, but uh, hmm. this is a cherished token of a gentleman's affection. Wow. I don't think that was Tim Conway. <laughs> <laughs> It was Bill Bixby. Okay, anyway, that, that makes more sense. <laughs> the yeah. three people in the audience who knew about that are yeah, thinking that's great. They're, anyway. they're close to death. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're old. Okay. I'm cutting it off. We need to let uh, our announcer speak. All right. Take it away, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> and that's a wrap. It doesn't take a genius. The blog dedicated to reducing the irreducible. Next time, prime numbers. What makes them so special? Join us then. And thanks for listening. That's good enough.